Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. By far, we are already experiencing one of the best election seasons yet, and we're not even close to election day. And we've had a couple of uh, candidates come on to our show, discuss a few things that are going on within our community. I think we're at a crossroads, and we've mentioned this before here on Fronteras, we're at a crossroads where our community is emerging as one of the capitals of the Hispano-Latino community in America. And, and as that rise happens, a lot of people begin to turn on a national level to communities like our very own to see well, what exactly comes next. One of the big races that's focusing on these particular issues from a national and local point of view is the race for U.S. Congress. And of course, when it comes to U.S. Congress, uh, we have representation in the area, both in New Mexico side and on the Texas side. And El Paso, of course, we have our long-term Silvestre Reyes, U.S. Congressman Silvestre Reyes that has proudly represented uh, this community for quite some time. He also served on the Intelligence Committee not so long ago and has represented El Paso through a lot of quite interesting things. He is up for re-election against uh, a formidable opponent, former City Council Representative Beto O'Rourke, and we thought we would invite U.S. Congressman Silvestre Reyes to join us here today to discuss a little bit about well, our future, what comes next? So, Congressman, thank you for joining us. I appreciate you being here. We go way back when I had the radio right. show. You would come on regularly. I'm All glad right. to see you again. Glad to see you, Hector, and uh, glad uh, that you're still involved in, uh, uh, in a leadership capacity for the, for the region, because it is a region. Uh, you know, I love doing this, Congressman. I think you know how much I love doing it. We, we went out to Washington, D.C. not too long ago. You had us over there. When we had the radio show, we had the, the, a little bit of an opportunity to shadow you a little bit, mm -hmm. talk to a bunch of regular folks that were right. doing good work for El Paso. And I thought it would be a good opportunity for us to talk a little bit about, um, on this time around here on television, about your role, uh, not only in U.S. Congress, but within our community, because it's, it's been a role that has been there for a while. Um, a lot of people have been uh, refocusing in, in your particular position for our community because there is a race going on. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I thought I would begin with, with, with a very uh, simple question because I'm not sure very many people know the story. You and I have talked about it. I think it's an interesting one. Your, your back end story, what, what led to politics? What wow. led you to, to where you are today? Well, I, I think uh, that story goes back to uh, even when I was uh, on the farm because uh, my dad and my grandfather and uncle were all very active in Democratic Party politics here uh, uh, in El Paso and the whole, and the whole region. Uh, for me, I uh, uh, was taken off that farm by the United States Army and had an opportunity and an, on an honor to serve our nation and spent 13 months in Vietnam, to almost three years uh, total in the Army. When I left the, uh, the Army, uh, I went to work for the Border Patrol and uh, started out as an agent in Del Rio, Texas mm -hmm. uh, and worked my way up the, the ladder to, to become the, the first chief, uh, first Latino chief in the Border Patrol history. And that was in 1984. Uh, I learned uh, from that experience that uh, it's much better to have the community on your side mm -hmm. uh, when, you're, when you're doing a, an important job uh, uh, such as border in enforcement. Mm -hmm. So I always prioritized uh, that aspect of it, uh, telling people three basic things. What we do as Border Patrol, uh, why it's important, and how it, it can impact them. Mm -hmm. and, and that was uh, kind of the, uh, the, the premise to go out and give uh, a number of speaking uh, uh, engagements with the locals the local uh, service clubs, uh, uh, just about anyone that wanted to know what we were doing. This was in the Rio Grande Valley. Mm -hmm. So that uh, gave me uh, the exposure into the political arena because uh, when I was chief in, in McAllen, 
the, the big issue was Central America mm -hmm. and the influx of Central Americans through the McAllen sector. And uh, I had the responsibility uh, to manage that. So uh, from there, I spent nine years there as a chief. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1993, they moved me to El Paso and they moved me back home where I was born and where I grew up uh, because the sector here was pretty much uh, 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 it, not so much out of control as it was under siege by mm. the community. They, yeah. At that time, when I got here, they were talking about the Border Patrol being relocated outside the city limits and leaving them alone, which is really contrary to what I had experienced in the Rio Grande Valley. They liked us, uh, they knew what we were doing, why we were there, and they wanted us there. So that's when I started uh, here doing the same thing, mm -hmm. reaching out to different people, different uh, political uh, clubs and anyone that wanted to hear about our our mission. Yeah. Uh, as a result of that, I came up with a strategy, Operation Hold the Line, uh, which really was dramatic because it ended about 10,000 illegal entries a day in El, in the El Paso uh, area, the El Paso city limits. Uh, That's to pretty significant. To less than yeah. 200. It went from 10,000 a day to less than 200. To less than 200, under your... And under this operation that I designed. And uh, that's really where uh, people took notice. And, and it really changed the lives dramatically. Uh, imagine living on border highway and how 10,000 illegal entries can affect you day after day after day. Yeah. People were frustrated. We there's, stopped that. There's a couple of pictures that I've seen of you during the, the days, your days as, as the chief of the Border Patrol, uh, where you're briefing out in Washington, D.C. There's, I think there's even a couple of you at the White House. Right. Uh, tell me what that was like. I mean, uh, it w what was the first time like when you first arrived uh, in your, you know, capacity as Chief of Border Patrol to, to D.C. to inform, you know, the, the, the various legislative bodies, including the executive office? Well, uh, during the course of my 12 years or so as, as a chief, uh, I had... Uh, uh, many opportunities to brief members of Congress uh, and also other leaders uh, uh, of, of the administration mm -hmm. uh, about what we were doing in South Texas and then uh, in El Paso. Operation Hold the Line uh, became an instant uh, 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 recognizable uh, hit internationally because we stopped all those, all those illegal entries. Right. Um, for many months, Washington, the central central headquarters in Washington for Border Patrol, uh, refused to acknowledge that the operation was for the first time controlling the, the border. So it was kind of interesting. Uh, it wasn't until almost a year later that uh, President Clinton asked for a briefing on that. They tried to give him the briefing from the headquarters and he said, no, I want these two chiefs, and I was one of them, and the other one was Gus de la Viña, who uh, had followed my lead and had started a similar operation uh, in uh, Chula Vista. Uh, so we got the invite. Uh, as always happens, the commissioner was there and said, look, this is what you're going to say. This, this is how you're going to th say it. Is, this is the, these are the you limits. Don't leave those parameters. Exactly. Yeah. Very. But, well, when I got to the when, when we got to the, the briefing in the Oval Office, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Attorney General Reno was there. Uh, of course, the President, uh, uh, Vice President Gore, just, just a small group, uh, uh, about six people. Uh, and the interesting thing is uh, the instructions that, that we got, mm -hmm. of mandate of wh how we're supposed to brief, really quickly went out the window because if you've ever sat in a conversation with uh, former President Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. you know that he'll ask you every question imaginable yeah. and some that you didn't imagine. Yeah. And he remembers so, names too. You oh. know, he met me when I was uh, when I was in, in high school, uh, when he came to El Paso for his second uh, campaign, '96, I believe. Right, he came yeah. to El Paso. He he, he, <coughs> he he remembered my name when he saw me again at Georgetown. Oh, unbelievable. he's incredible, unbelievable, and he's phenomenal. Th you know, the the thing is, I I can imagine so. So here, I know how I felt the first time I, I was there, uh -huh. you know, as a kid. Now here you are as a Border Patrol chief, yeah. uh, representing the community. You began your life at the farm. What does that feel, what goes through your mind when you're there? Well, I mean. Well, the, uh, I think what 
probably goes through every American's mind. Only in this country can we can we have this kind of a story play out yeah. nearly every day. I mean, I was one, but uh, you know, Gus de la Vigna was another, and 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 I think this country gives us that kind of opportunity, and uh, that's what gave me the opportunity to be in Congress because uh, of the job that I had done that El Paso received so well uh, that, uh, you know, everything from vehicle thefts to, to petty crime and all of the kinds of things, uh, people couldn't see enough good things about the job that the Border Patrol was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then came the uh, uh, a, a group of people that took me to lunch, mm -hmm. I thought to thank me for the work that we were doing and we were doing it well, but they they had an interesting proposal. They said, "We want you to run for Congress." And I said, "Oh, wait a minute, sis. I I, I don't mind. Uh, you know, thank you for the attention. Thank you for the great honor. But I'm I'm a federal law enforcement officer. Right. And uh, so anyway, make a long story short, they worked on me for six, seven months. Uh, they uh, brought in my brother Chuy to their group and. And I finally, uh, finally decided. Well, maybe I can do more for this community as a member of Congress. Now, uh, this yeah. happens during a time when I, I mean, uh, your your predecessor was was U.S. Congressman Ron Coleman. Correct. Yeah. So, this was happening during the time when there was that whole check writing scandal, yes. hot checks, and all sorts of stuff. And, and U.S. Congressman Coleman had been dragged into a lot of the right. conversation Correct. regarding yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts when you when you know this is going on? You know this this opportunity. What are the pros and cons that go through your mind about about running for office and, and representing your community uh, well, after you've had the opportunity to be a, a well? Chief it's, it's it's a pretty scary proposition because I knew my job very well. I was confident in uh, in in terms of law enforcement, border security, uh, all of the things that that I had worked at for 26 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but when an opportunity like this, first of all, it's a great honor that they even consider you supporting you. Uh, secondly, it's, uh, it's a situation where you're going to, you know, just by virtue, I knew, I'm going to say, well over 40 members of Congress very well mm -hmm. by this time. Mm -hmm. So I know, I knew who they were, the work that they did, the things that they, the challenges that they faced, the variety of issues that they had to, to deal with. It wasn't just border security for them; it was everything else mm -hmm. uh, along there. So that's why I think it took so long to get to a point to where I would even consider it. And then I had never uh, given it any thought to run for Congress. So you have to learn from from the bottom yeah. uh, up. What steep learning curve. Oh I my imagine. gosh, it, yeah. it, it was. So, so uh, I was very fortunate to have uh, my brother Chewy be the, uh, the campaign manager. In fact, famously he said, come on, run, it'll be fun. <laughs> uh, so so now, I, now I remind him every once in a while when things are not so much fun, I yeah. said, hey, run, <laughs> it'll be fun. But, but it has been. It's been, uh, uh, I have to tell you this story. I went home when they first uh, invited me to lunch, and I told my wife, I said, hey, this group asked me if I would be interested in running for Congress. She says, oh my God, what did you say? I said, I, I told them no. So my daughter comes home, my daughter that's now a doctor, mm -hmm. has a doctorate in, ed in education, uh, and she's now a principal. Uh, she comes home, and I said, uh, mija, they, they want me to run for Congress. And she turned around and said, absolutely not, I am not gonna have anyone calling my dad a politician. And so my wife was not in favor of it. Monica was not in favor of it. The, the one that was in favor of, of it was my other daughter who was living in Austin at the time. And she said, awesome, dad, let's do it. I'll come home. <laughs> I'll help with the campaign. Uh, but, but. Uh, so it's a family divided there. Uh, well, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it, for, yeah. For those six, seven months, I, yeah. I finally told my daughter Monica, I said, you know, if regular people don't step up and uh, do their part. Right. I mean, we're always going to have that perception that politics is a dirty word, that being called a politician is, uh, is not good uh, uh, for, for anyone. Right. I said, so I think, I think it's something that I might want to try to do. 
let's talk about that then a little bit. I mean, so so here you are. You've made the decision. You run for office, and and we'll fast forward a little bit. You you win the office that you're seeking. You you win the election. Um, politics and, and, and all of your concerns, you know, about your, your family's concerns, being called a politician. Mm -hmm. Obviously, politics denotes a lot of a lot of a lot of negative things now, especially nowadays sure. with a lot of the, the local news even. Um, what are some of the highs and some of the lows uh, when it comes to, to, to politics? You've yeah. been there now. You've yeah. represented our community. Well, I think I'll start with the low. Uh, you know, there was a recent story in the local press about uh, the 600,000. Yes, uh, I was actually going to go right there. Yeah. That, that was supposed to have gone to my family and, and, and to me. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. The, the politics after Citizens United, the decision by the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. uh, has given people that are very wealthy and uh, have an agenda the ability to contribute to organizations who do nothing except try to go through uh, the reports and all of the things that we have to file by law uh, to, try to, to try to see if someone can be painted as, uh, as a as a bad politician. What, what's interesting about this story is that they took the two cycles where I was the chairman. Uh, the, uh, you know, we won back the House in 06, mm -hmm. 2006. So I became chairman of the, of the Intelligence Committee uh, in January of 07. Mm -hmm. So they took the 07, 08 cycle and then the 09 and 10 cycle. And I think y you, more than anybody else here, understands that when you're a full chairman, mm -hmm. and remember, I was the only chairman, full chairman of a, of a committee mm -hmm. from Texas. Right. And so... And a pretty big committee at that. And, well, I mean, it was and a very important and influential committee. Right. Right. Uh, and so anything that Dallas wanted, anything that Houston wanted, Corpus, San Antonio, uh, San Angelo, you pick a city. Being in a chairmanship and so means that, certain things that, for Texas. That means that I am at that table exactly. with 17 other people and the Democratic Party leadership, uh, and we're discussing what our agenda is. Mm -hmm. So anyone that has issues about the port of Houston, which really happened, I was the one that was asked to go to, to, go to Houston, get briefed on it, and help them with those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone that had an issue with uh, the data systems that are prolific uh, in the Dallas area. Uh, they had their concerns. Uh, uh, they called on me and I went there to get those briefings to understand what it was that was important to Dallas and to Texas with those data banks. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, after 9-11, one, one of the issues that we identified that we had to address was the continuation of government because if there's a dirty bomb that goes off in Washington, D.C. and New York, they're all in the eastern grid. Mm -hmm. So that renders our ability to function as a, as a nation uh, pretty much moot until they can get those systems back up. Back up so what I did when I became chair is uh, I took that on as an issue for the 16 uh, agencies that deal with intelligence. The one, perhaps one of the most critical parts of our effort against Al Qaeda and all of the other organizations that are trying to take us out. Uh, and uh, so uh, we put in a center in San Antonio f just for that reason, almost half a billion dollars mm -hmm. so that we could have a continuation of government facility that could manage if, if uh, New York and Washington DC were taken out. Right. So those two cycles, Besides doing all those kinds of things for Texas and for the country, I was also having to travel around and uh, uh, campaigning for, for other members, uh, sometimes trying to convince member or people to run for Congress, mm -hmm. all those kinds of things that a full committee chair has to do because you're part of that leadership and you're part of that effort. So the money that was reported by this organization crew was money that didn't go into my pocket. It, it was money that went to the airlines, to the hotels, to the restaurants as I went around doing, doing my job. Mm -hmm. but, it, but when you're talking about uh, dirty politics, uh, that's how you leave a bad impression 
uh, on an individual that uh, otherwise uh, I think I've I've got a very strong record of delivering not just for El Paso but for the whole region uh, and also uh, uh, working on things that are going to be uh, very instrumental in how we move forward in this whole in this whole region whether they're infrastructure projects whether they're border security uh, uh, projects I mean just just a number of them so, so, when so you're talking that's about lows, lows. That's that's a low. So but when you so when somebody says you know take a look at the six hundred thousand as a as as a headline, um, your response is read the story. <laughs> take a look at where the money was, exactly. was spent. Exactly. Read the story. Read read where that money was spent. Uh, uh, you know. So you're, you're, it's creative <laughs> headlines, and the, you're you're saying that the low is sometimes a creative headline. Yeah. Well. And, do you and, do and you and take issue with with perhaps? A headline like that coming out when there's such negative storylines about politicians in our community right now, from the FBI scandal oh, to, sure. the, I mean, to the to the Sunland Park situation and all that. Yeah. I mean, do you take issue with that? Does that? What is your fam? How does your family react? Well, I'm, I mean, my family obviously th they know what's true. They uh, and and you know the irony in this thing is uh, six months back or so, uh, I was called by a reporter doing a story on the on the six poorest members of Congress from Texas. Um, it was uh, uh, a Republican, a Democrat, and then myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically want to know, how come when everybody else is profiting you know, from public service, why have your reports remained constant? And I said, look, I need to tell you, just like I told, tell other people, I'm not in public service to profit from it. Uh, I am p in public service to make a difference. I, I want people to know that uh, when I came to office, this is what I was worth. When I leave office, it'll still be the same, the same uh, uh, worth there because I'm, I'm not into profiting uh, yeah. from public service. Let's talk about some of the highs. You're, there, there's been a lot of talk about your campaign slogan, Reyes Works. Right. Um, I, I famously asked this question uh, both on radio when I was on radio and and here on the show to all of the all of the local representatives that come by all of the elected officials what is your vision for the area and 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 how does a Reyes works uh, you know kind of titled or, or, or campaign slogan fit into that that vision that you have for El Paso because we've heard a lot about the whole Reyes works slogan well you, you know and I think I have to put it in, in the context that today Congress has very low approval ratings. Uh, you know, pick a survey, or pick a poll, 9%, 12%, th that's, th that's the reality. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the representatives from the Tea Party that, that come to Congress to frustrate people in America with the workings of the federal government, to make them, to, to get them upset at the fact that we've got gridlock in Washington, D.C. And so, uh, having been, being an incumbent, having been uh, there for 15 years, this is my 16th year, I, I'm finishing out eight terms, uh, I, was, I, w I was thinking and, and expressing some frustration because I work very hard at this job. Mm -hmm. This job is the greatest honor anyone uh, can have because there are uh, uh, thousands of people that vote for you and put their trust in in you doing everything that you can to make sure that uh, the district uh, functions and that we do all the kinds of things that that are, that are necessary so from that uh, from that perspective uh, I, I was voicing the fact that you know I work hard at this job uh, I'm usually at the office sometime before eight o'clock uh, and I don't get back home to in DC mm -hmm. till nine o'clock, ten o'clock at night. I read my briefing book and I start that cycle all over again. Uh, but it's a it, but it's a great honor. And the important thing to note is that every member decides for him or herself how they're going to approach this job. I have I decided a long time ago that I was going to work during the time that I'm in this job as hard as I knew how so that El Paso would move forward, so that my kids and grandkids would have the opportunity to raise families with good paying jobs in a community 
that uh, uh, has the best to offer because I think I think I was born here, I was raised here, I'm going to come back and and eventually die here. Uh, so I want that to be the legacy that uh, someday my my grandson Orlando will say, hey. Grandpa did all this stuff back when I was four years old, and now I'm able to do this because of it. It's the last minute, and I, and I wish we could go on, because you and I could stay on like, like we used to back on radio for, <laughs> for hours. But, Congressman, um, let me ask you this. Your biggest accomplishment in the last minute uh, in all of this time in Congress? Well, I think the fundamental best thing that, you can, that I can point to are the constituency services. Because every day there's somebody that needs help with Social Security, with Medicare, with Medicaid, with health care. Somebody uh, is having a tough time in my district and they're reaching out to, to, uh, uh, for us to help them with that issue. There are a lot of things I could point out to saving Fort Bliss, uh, investing five billion dollars in infrastructure, a brand new hospital, working for veterans. All of those things are important, but I think the fundamental core uh, issue that that you're about as a representative is helping people every single day because th for them that's the issue that's most important. It may, not, it may not be in the whole scheme of things, Pakistan, Iran and all these other things, but for that person, for that individual, that Social Security issue, that Medicare, Medicaid issue is their most important thing and it's a it's an honor to help them through those things. Well, Congressman, I'm going to have to thank you for, for coming thank out. You. We're going to have to do this again uh, at some point. I always enjoy a conversation. Folks, we hope that you were able to come away a little bit more with a better perspective of uh, Congressman Silvestre Reyes in his bid to become your congressman. Again, we will make every effort to also invite all a lot of other candidates, all the candidates in this race, to come on to our show so that you can get a better idea. For all of us here at Fronteras, have a good evening. I'm Hector H. Lopez. Thank you.